Hello everyone and welcome to the webinar on the United Nations Youth Volunteers Program. First of all, I'd like to thank you all for attending. My name is Victoria and I'm going to lead you through the webinar this afternoon. Can I please ask you to keep your microphone muted so that everyone can listen to the presentation. Right now, I'm at our office here at Sanfo in Biel and there are three recruitment specialists from Sanfo in the room with me. The first two are Doris Lucy and Julie Almond who will be answering your written questions via chat during the next hour. Hi everyone. Hello. Hello. The third one is Nora Lander, Outreach and Recruitment Officer at Sanfo and also former UN Youth Volunteer. She will be speaking about her own experience as UN Youth Volunteer and answer some of your questions orally. Hi everyone. So from now on, you can send us your questions via chat until the end of the webinar. To do so, you can click on the chat symbol on the top right and you will see the chat box at the bottom right of your page. During the first half of the webinar, the questions will only be answered within the chat. In the second half, however, we will pick out some questions that we think may be interesting for everyone and answer them orally. We encourage you to listen to the presentation carefully as you will probably find most of your answers. We will be speaking in English, but feel free to ask your questions in French or German if you feel more comfortable doing so. Finally, I'd like to mention that the webinar will be recorded and uploaded on, your website, on our website afterwards. You'll also find the slides there, so no need to write everything down. As you can see on your agenda, in this presentation we will elaborate on the following aspects. First of all, I will briefly speak about UNB, its objectives and actions. Then we will concentrate on the program that we are here for today, the UN Youth Volunteers Program. Nora will tell you about her experience as a UN Youth Volunteer, the tasks and challenges you may face during the assignment, and what skills and competencies are required. We will then continue explaining the recruitment process and give you some tips on how to apply through our website. We will further give you advice on how to make your decision when choosing the positions you want to apply for. Last but not least, we will answer some more of your questions during the Q&A session. The United Nations Volunteers Program is the UN organization that contributes to peace and development through volunteerism. So UNV is actually a UN organization on its own. It is, however, different from the other organizations. It only has a few own programs and it's primarily a recruitment agency. Its core business is to recruit and deploy volunteers to various UN organizations. Based in Bonn, Germany, UNB deploys over 7,000 volunteers to UN organizations in more than 130 countries every year. Now, what are UN nations volunteers? UN volunteers are recruited to various UN organizations, for example, UNICEF, UNHCR, UNDP, or also peacekeeping missions. Even though UN volunteers have a volunteer stages, they are actually integrated into the team they work with. So they belong to the UN personnel in a given country. UNBs get a monthly living allowance of around 1,500 to 3,000 USD, depending on their duty station and respective living costs. There are two types of UNVs. First of all, there are the UNV specialists, and the second ones are the UNU volunteers, which I will speak about in a minute. On your left is the UNV specialist program, which recruits specialists in different fields based on the current needs of UN organizations. This program is for professionals who have a bachelor's or master's degree and at least two to five years of professional experience. There is no age restriction. They usually deploy for six months, but the assignments are renewable up to three years. These positions are paid by the UN organizations hiring the specialists. For this reason, this program is open to nationals of all countries and the recruitment is directly managed by the UNB headquarters in Bonn. In order to become eligible, you need to create a profile on the roster and you'll be contacted in if there is an opening that matches your profile. The second program, which we will focus on today, is for UN Youth Volunteers. This program was created to give young graduates without much professional experience the opportunity to start a career in international cooperation. 
So the first and foremost difference between this program and the one on the left is that these positions are financed by a dozen of countries only. The positions funded by Switzerland are only open to Swiss nationals with a master's degree who are born on or after the 1st of July 1988. Two national languages and English are also required. As I mentioned before, UNU volunteers also receive a living allowance of between 1,500 and 3,000 USD, depending on their duty station. Additionally, travel expenses and health insurance are covered for. The assignments are always of one year duration. In Switzerland, it's the Human Security Division and the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation of the Federal Department of Foreign Affairs that finances around 20 positions for the next intake. As I mentioned earlier, these positions are only open to graduates with Swiss nationality. The program is a unique opportunity for young graduates who have recently finished their studies to get a first experience with the UN in the field and take a first step towards a career in international cooperation. In 2013, SAMFO conducted a study to evaluate the UNB programs. The study examined data from volunteers who were deployed between 2002 and 2013. You can see from the quote on the screen, the results are very encouraging. The program is definitely a great way to start a career in international cooperation. At this stage, however, I'd like to mention that a UN Youth Volunteer Assignment doesn't guarantee that you will receive a contract afterwards or you will continue working within the United Nations system. It's simply a relevant experience for UCD and a plus to start a career within the UN or international cooperation. We will now talk about what it actually means to be a youth volunteer, what is required and what are the tasks and challenges that they encounter. I'll give the floor to Nora, who will now tell us about her own experience as a UN youth volunteer in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Thank you, Vitori, for this introduction. <coughs> for me, my UN youth volunteer assignment was definitely the beginning of my career not just in international cooperation, but also in the UN system. So I applied to the UN Youth Frontier Program back in 2006, 10 years ago, just have, after having obtained my Master's in International Relations. I got selected to the program and spent one year as Monitoring and Evaluation Officer at the United Nations Development Program, UNDP, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So this UNB assignment was the opportunity for me. It was my first step into the labor market, into the domain of international cooperation and the UN. It opened many doors for me and allowed me eventually to start a career in the UN. On the slide in front of you, I'm now going to list the main reasons why I think a youth volunteer assignment is a unique opportunity for any Swiss young graduate. So first, serving as a UN Youth Volunteer allows you to obtain professional experience right after graduating. That is considered full-time relevant professional experience when you apply for employment later on, for instance with the UN. My UN Youth Volunteer experience was also considered relevant and of interest when I applied for positions in the private sector in Switzerland afterwards. Second, when working as a UN Youth Volunteer, you acquire professional experience not just with any employer, but with the UN. How else do you get to work for the UN, especially if you do not already possess solid work experience? Third, through the UN Youth Volunteers program, you gain professional experience at field level, sometimes in rather challenging duty stations. This is actually a much sought for experience by employers in international cooperation and, in my case, totally boosted my career. As UN Youth Volunteer, you do not have to pay or cover for any expenditures. So you receive, as um, Victoria mentioned, you, you receive a living allowance, depending on the living costs in the, in the country you serve, which is between $1,500 and $3,000 a month. <coughs> Excuse me. And that living allowance is sufficient to cover for your expenses especially if you have a modest living lifestyle and do not have family members to take care of. In my case, I was able to travel home twice, to travel home to Switzerland twice, and even got some to save some money. In addition, as a UN Youth Volunteer, you get 
enrolled into the UN Health Insurance, the, the Cigna, which is an ex excellent, and, uh, excellent health insurance and offers coverage beyond the mandatory coverage of Swiss health insurances. And then, of course, all your duty-related um, travel costs are taken care of by the UN. In terms of career development, in my case, I have, and I have seen this often later on, in um, other, other cases, the use assign assignment allowed me to identify my functional area, which eventually was not monitoring and evaluation, but human resources, um, because that was eventually what I ended up doing as a volunteer with the UN. In addition, through my UN Youth Volunteer Assignment, I got exposure and was able to network, which helped me to get a job after the youth assignment. So at the end of my Youth Volunteer Assignment, I was offered to continue as consultant at UNDP in Kinshasa, and also had an offer to join the then newly created peace mission in Nepal as UN Re Specialist, which I then went, went for. Then later on, the youth assignment also helped me to get my junior professional officer position at UN headquarters in New York. And um, so my boss, my then boss, boss said that um, she, she selected me because I had the specific UN field experience. And then, as I, as I said earlier, this UN field experience was also valued when I worked for UBS in between the UN assignments. So again, looking back, I did. I actually not realize when I was out there in Kinshasa that this experience as, as youth volunteer would totally advance my professional career. Thank you, Nora, for this insight. That sounds really very exciting. Let us briefly focus on the more difficult aspects of serving as a UN volunteer so that you will get more, a more realistic and authentic picture. We would like to show you what Lucas Fichte, a former UN youth volunteer from the intake of 2014, said about his own experience. As we saw, Lucas had a, quite a few challenges to deal with, especially the fact that he ended up doing other things that described in his job description. Nora, thinking of your own experience, do you think this is something that can happen to other UN youth volunteers as well? Yes, absolutely. We have seen changes in responsibilities and tasks very often. In my case, for instance, it was quite extreme. I was recruited as a monitoring and evaluation officer but because of budget cuts and cancellation of projects that I, that I should have monitored, I ended up working in human resources. So it's important to know that what is written in the job description won't necessarily be your main task when starting your use assignments. You have to keep in mind that these descriptions were normally drafted months or even a whole year prior to the beginning of your assignment. And this is why, at the time of your arrival, the circumstances or even the team may have changed and the person who drafted the job description may have left. So being flexible and open are important competencies for a UN youth volunteer. Being proactive, looking for tasks you could take on, suggesting new ways of doing things or coming up with new small projects within your area of responsibilities is important. And in doing so, you can find your place within the team more easily and eventually do something meaningful. 
And uh, are there any other challenges you faced as a United Nations youth volunteer in the DRC? Oh yes, indeed, there were uh, a few more challenges. So for instance, supervision. Supervision may sometimes be a little disappointing or dissatisfactory. As mentioned earlier, for one reason or another, the supervisor may not have enough time to support you appropriately. appropriately. Especially in these days where we have seen lots of budget cuts and everyone has to do more with less, coaching and quality supervision may not always be available. Um, this again is why you and you volunteers need to be independent, responsible and proactive to find pragmatic solutions yourself. Another challenge I can think of are the living conditions in the country of assignment. Um, security is taken quite seriously by the UN and this may limit um, some of your freedom, like freedom of movement. I was, for instance, not allowed to walk in the streets of Kinshasa nor to take local taxis and had to figure out pick up by the UN driver, which was not really available, um, or arrange, um, get, have my own arrangement with colleagues who afforded having a car to get around. Um, lastly, a challenge that probably all UN youth volunteers encounter is having to face poverty. While this seems quite logical, um, it is still something different if you do not just travel but you actually live and work in a place where extreme poverty is constantly around you. And it can be painful to realize that the UN and other actors can only do as much as they can. But do you think these challenges uh, were specific to your experience, only your challenges, or do you think uh, that uh, could, uh, future UNVs also would face them? Especially two first points, flexibility regarding your actual tasks and responsibilities, and lack of supervision guidance are very common challenges. And I would say not only common challenges for youth volunteers, but actually for anyone working for the UN. So given the challenges that a youth volunteer has to be able to cope with, what do you consider the most important competencies a youth volunteer should have? That's a good question. From what I just said about my own experience and from what we have heard from other youth volunteers too, I would say that flexibility is one of the most important competencies of a youth volunteer. Because first you already have to deal with the long recruitment process a quite sudden selection decision towards the end of the year, and once deployed, often quite substantive changes in your tasks. Then another challenge, um, other challenges would be communication, intercultural sensitivity, planning and organizing skills. They are very important because your news volunteers are often to collaborate with local partners, civil society organizations or other international organizations. And they get to organize meetings, workshops, or other events, for instance, to train local partners or to increase public awareness on a specific topic. Then um, analytical and research skills are important because youth volunteers often support project management. So they have to write background papers and develop project proposals, or they support their teams in reporting to donors or the organization's headquarters, and they also contribute to drafting concepts and policies. Then a strong personality is important because the supervisor, for instance, may not always be available or may not have much time for you, as I mentioned before. So you need to know how to help yourself. You need to be able to find solutions on your own and to work in sometimes difficult or stressful circumstances. Then um, commitment to volunteerism. Um, it's quite important to men mention this one. Although you get quite a good living allowance, you still don't earn as much as the UN staff with whom you work and who are your colleagues. So this may be frustrating as you may sometimes find yourself working more than, than your colleagues around you who earn much more. In addition, there is this idea that any UNB volunteers outside of work. And this may be challenging if you have a busy job and hardly find time um, to do so. So this means once more that you and youth volunteers need to be proactive and look on their own for small local projects they can volunteer for. And then I should also say that in addition to the skills and competencies mentioned, um, each description of assignment lists the specific skills that are required in terms of your academic background and work exposure. And then if I may add, the most important skill for me has been humor. This makes you either love or hate what you do. Thank you, Nora, for sharing your experience. Uh, I'm sure the audience now has a better idea of how the assignments are like 
and we laugh a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> I will now turn to the recruitment process and um, you can follow the steps that will be on the slide in front of you. As you know, you can still apply for the open positions until the 26th of September. That's in two weeks. We will then make a first selection of candidates that we will invite for an interview here at SAFO in Biel. The interviews will take place between the 17th and the 27th of October. After the interviews, we elaborate reports and recommendations that we send to the UNB headquarter in Bonn, who will transfer the dossiers of selected candidates to the UN organizations. They will make their final decision and candidates will be notified of their selection mid-December. As you can see, it's quite a long recruitment process, which is why it's important to be patient. <laughs> selected candidates will then have a training at Sampo in Biel and a visit to representatives of SDC and HSD in Bern. And finally, another training for all human new volunteers in Bonn shortly before deployment. After returning from their assignment, they will get another debriefing by Sampo in Biel. The transport fees, of course, for these training days will be reimbursed, so you don't need to pay anything. Don't worry. <laughs> a few important things to keep in mind. Um, let's have a look at the application procedure. For this, I would like to show you the three most important steps, uh, maybe four, <laughs> when applying through our online recruitment tool. When you click on the link to apply, you will be redirected to the website you can see in this picture. Here you can simply add all your personal information and upload CV, cover letter and your master certificates. It is particularly important that you add your date of birth and your nationality. After having completed your personal information, you need to indicate the numbers of the positions you'd like to apply for. This is very, very important. As you know, you can apply for two positions at the same time, but you have to state which is your first choice. It's really important that you enter the numbers of these two positions here, as you won't be able to come back to this page afterwards. There's no need to write the title, just the number. Pay attention, the cover letter you will upload is only for your first choice. There is no need for a cover letter for your second choice. Also, since some of the positions require a driving license, we need to know whether you have a valid driver license or not. Driving licenses are accepted of for any country as long as they can be converted into an international one. Swiss licenses of category B, for example, are accepted. After indicating your choice, you will come to this page where you will have to indicate your language skills. At this page, you can click on Submit your job application. For the ones that already have created a profile and want to make some edits, for example, on your address, click on the link Edit Profile. Before turning to your questions, I would like to give you a little advice on, your choice, on the choice of the positions that interest you. It is important to pick your choice according to your interest for the first and the second choice. We've seen that the conditions in the field can sometimes be quite difficult, so it's really important that you're interested in both the topic and the local context. So the information on this slide is only relevant if you still hesitate while picking your second choice. The first one should be clear for everybody. After analyzing the positions for this year, we have to come to the conclusion that some may be more popular than others. You can see here which positions we expect to receive more applications for than others and which we believe will be less popular. These conclusions are based on previous experience and the popularity of topics. It's not always like this, but this is an estimation. Finally, I'd like to stress again how extraordinary the opportunity is that this program offers. Since it's only open to Swiss nationals, it's important to keep in mind that the usually global competition has been restricted to a national one here. So out of the 120 applications that might come in, you have a comparatively high chance of being selected. So make sure you don't miss it. 
Finally, I'd like to remind you of our studies that I quoted earlier, which can be found on our website, UN Youth Volunteers Program Intake 2017. The same website where you find everything regarding this program, including the link to apply for the positions and the recording of the webinar. Also visit UNV's website to find out more about the programs. And this is where our presentation ends. Thank you very much for your attention from all of us. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, we will now turn uh, um, to answer your questions. We will be happy to, to get some of the ones you asked earlier. So first questions for Nora. I have finished my master in August, but my graduation will only be in November. Is that a problem? Well, we would need to receive the, the actual master certificate in um, October. So yeah, we really would need to, to receive those before, before we conduct interviews. Just looking at the questions. Uh, second question, if we do not have our master diploma yet, is this enough to upload the transcript? I mean, if you get your master's degree by October, then yes, upload whatever you have that proves that you <coughs> um, have completed your studies and you're just awaiting that, um, that document. Nora, there is someone who would like to know if internships are calculated as full professional experience or only, for example, as a half experience. Yeah, um, we, we normally count them in as um, full professional experience, but we take a look um, at the entire profile and, um, you know, then becomes a competitive process depending on who the other candidates are. We then try to select the most promising candidates. But of course, also thinking of the target um, audience here, which are young graduates with limited professional experience. And uh, do you know if uh, someone is only available on certain dates? Not uh, on all dates between the 17th and the 27th of October, what happens? Um, we try to accommodate, but um, it may not always be possible. So um, we really we really hope that you can arrange, find arrangements for the, for the, for the dates that we suggest. Um, we do interviews via Skype. So um, when we offer Skype interview, make sure that you you can free yourself for an hour or so. And uh, what kind of interviews will be conducted at Sample? Com competency-based interviews? Yes, exactly. So we, we do competency-based interviews. That's what that's the, the technique that the UN uses. So we apply the same. And you find um, information on, on how to prepare for competency-based interviews on our website and on YouTube. And there's lots lots to read about and I, I really encourage you to prepare as um, we, say, we see a huge difference between people who have prepared themselves, have studied examples, have thought their experience through um, compared to others who, who improvise, uh, improvise on the spot. Um, there is someone that would like to know uh, once uh, in the field, um, how are we related to Switzerland? Do we have regular contact uh, and work somewhat in collaboration with the Swiss representations there? I mean, we, you at Sanfa, encourage you to, to contact and reach out to Swiss representation in the duty station. What you will certainly have to do is a reporting back to um, your, the, the unit or the office that funds your position here in Bern. So they would expect um, regular reporting and an exchange on, on your work. And we are also in touch re, re, with you, so SAFO, and support you throughout your assignment, but more with a career, human resources and career development lens.
And uh, what percentage of our, of um, the time are you and volunteers? Um, what percentage can be expected to spend in the field? Um, I'm not sure I understand this question. There's field and deep field and so on. So all UN youth volunteers are actually deployed to what is called um, field duty stations. So no one would work at an organization's headquarters. Um, but of course, that that could be a a capital. So, like in my case, I, I worked in Kinshasa. Um, others will be in more remote places. And then, probably, the question is whether you get to travel from your duty station, which will most probably be in, in the capital of a given country, to any other city or village. And that totally depends on your um, on your responsibilities. And that's certainly also some, something that you can try to influence a little bit, or you know, you can express interest for um, that you can, can travel. In my case, I was able to, within 12 months, to travel um, three times to the eastern part of Congo. And um, yeah, there is a huge peacekeeping mission there, so I was able to, to use the UN planes and transport, and that's quite an adventure. There is someone that says hi to you and ask you if it would be okay to indicate that they plan on getting their driver license in November, December, instead of already having it. Um, so it depends on um, on the post you apply for. You will see that Human Security Division um, has this as a strong requirement that they they would like all youth volunteers to have the driving license. Um, out of security, you know, security considerations. So we would need to see that um, in, in October, just like for the master's um, certificate. Um, are the positions for you and women mainly meant for female candidates? Not at all. Actually, you and women is how there has been quite actively looking for um, male staff. So, um, not totally. So, um, yeah, all male candidates or interested um, applicants should consider this, this position. I think for now there are, there are more women working at UN Women and um, just like in any other organization, they would like to achieve a gender balance. Um, is a prior internship experience with a specific UN agency, for example, UNHCR, an important advantage when applying for a position with the same agency? I would think so, yes. That's, you know, you, you demonstrate that you know the organization already a little bit, that um, you know a bit what you talk about. Um, so, yes, yeah, certainly that, that's um, an advantage. And usually with internships, it is said that the last graduation should not be more than one year ago. Is it oh, the same for you and you volunteers? No, no, no. There is no such limitation. No, no, no. It doesn't matter really when you you feel, you, you know the limitations we have are um, age limitations and um, not more. I mean, we really want people who have only some professional experience. Um, so. Limitation would be not more than one year of experience abroad, and um, not more than two years of professional experience in total. There is someone that would like to know if, um, when you have the requirement fluency in spoken and written French, does it mean that you have to be mother tongue, or can you have uh, also a study experience? or a certificate in French, do you have any specific requirements for that? Um, I, would, I would say a C1 is um, sufficient. Just, I mean, my experience again has been 10 years ago, but um, so I studied in Geneva. I'm, my mother tongue is German, as you can hear, um, and I worked in Kinshasa, which is a francophone environment, and that was quite sufficient. I'm just trying to scroll through some other questions that might be of interest to the group. So, um, 
So you emphasized Nora before that uh, uh, basically no work experience is required, but uh, both of the Kosovo assignment descriptions apparently demand a proven record of work in international cooperation, conflict resolution, peace building, etc. Um, can uh, can someone still apply even if they don't have this work experience in the humanitarian sector? Yes, that's a very good question. Um, Yes, please do, do apply. Um, the requirements that we communicated are the requir requirements we use for the pre-selection of candidates. And I would assume that in this in these specific, specific terms of references, um, description of assignments um, with regard to the Kosovo assignment, the hiring manager just used an old description of assignment for a United Nations volunteer specialist and um, redrafted it a little bit and forgot to delete that, air, that part. So um, that's quite misleading, and I'm I'm sorry for that. But no, please go ahead and, and apply. And and, and that, this is a bit wishful thinking, of course. But it's quite clear that these these are not UNV specialist assignments. These are youth volunteer assignments. So again, for young graduates with hardly any or with limited professional experience. And uh, if the if the certificates of uh, work or master are in German or French, is it important to to um, translate them in, uh, in English? No, 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 not at all. We we review them and we um, have all the languages, here, three languages here in, in at Safo. Um, how many people does uh, Safo recommend for UNV uh, positions for each position? Um, depends on on the performance of candidates we interview, so there is no strict number. We usually get to interview about three people per post, and then would like to recommend at least two people for the position, so that the UNB office in um, that that would receive you still have a choice. And uh, should um, the CV entail a picture or not? It's not mandatory, but that's up to you to design, you know, the format and the look of how you'd like to present yourself. Is it important to add the work and inter internship certificates to the application? Yes, absolutely. Please do so. Add any certification, any proof of prior experience, also for volunteering. So that's quite important. If you have volunteered in your free time, during your studies, before, after, um, that that's really looked into. They really, you know, UNB really wants people who are interested and um, committed to volunteering. So any certificate or recommendation letter you you can organize, upload that and add it to your application. Going through the questions here. Excuse me, do we also need to write the cover letter in English please for the position? Your, please send us your questions in, in white chat, please. We won't be able to manage um, the questions orally. Apologies. Please send your questions via the chat. So you have. Um, a chat box on the right hand side of the screen normally. Just waiting for some new new questions coming. Uh, Nora, if you have a work experience abroad as part of the master's program, um, which this experience uh, uh, Count uh, or would it exceed if it exceeds the We it depends, but we I would still apply. And again, it's a com it's a competitive process, so we look at um, the other candidates, and um, depending then on that, you either make it or not. So I would I would still go and, and apply for the positions that are of interest to you.
Is it necessary to have a language certificate in Spanish to apply for the positions in Latin America? And um, a B1, B2 level of Spanish, would it be enough for applying to these positions? I mean, having language certificates um, is, is a nice thing to have. Um, but at the same time, we will also um, check um, language knowledge during the interview. And um, yeah, if you if you want to work in a Latin American country, just like in a Francophone country, you have to be fluent in either Spanish or French. So that would then be your working language. You would interact and work and draft and write in in that language. And um, what if? Um um, you have more than two years of work experience, but not necessarily in the field of the post position. Um, then I would say you are probably over overqualified. Again, if you're really interested, um, we encourage you to still apply. As I said many times now, it's um, a complex competitive process. And it depends on who the other candidates are, but um, you're rather overqualified because we really want to keep this program for young graduates with just a little experience. Someone would like to know if multiple nationalities um, are an asset or a liability. Um, it appears that certain nationalities are not an advantage depending on the location for some uh, international organizations. For example, ICRC prefers not hiring French nationals for certain missions in Africa. Is that true? So in our, for the Swiss Youth Volunteer Program, that's not of any um, obstacle. So having multiple nationalities um, is not a problem. You have to state them when you apply, um, but that, that is not a, a problem. You're not going to descend to a place where there is um, an active conflict. Ongoing. I mean, you know, in that city. And if 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 there are if security deteriorates, then you would get, um, you know, you and we would look look for other possibilities outside of the country, or close by. And do you think that a study experience abroad in a similar context, for example, an African continent, be, uh, would be an advantage when applying for a position? Yes, absolutely. So the more it's really important that you take. You take your time when you apply for a position and you, you know, tailor your application, both your CV and your motivation letter, to the to your first choice, to to, the, to that position. The more you you use the words that you find in the description of assignments, the closer your profile is to what they look for, the better your chances to get um, shortlisted and to get selected eventually. So make sure you mention anything, any experience, any exposure that could be somewhat related to the position in your application. That's very, very important. Looking for some more questions coming in. So someone is asking um, if uh, you have to apply for a specific position with the UNU Volunteers Program. And yes, you have. So it's a program, but at the same time, it comprises of 20 specific positions. So when you apply, you have to choose a f your first choice. So you have to tell us which post you would like to go for. And that's the position you tailor your application to. And then you can also um, communicate the second choice to us, but um, that's just, you know, as Victoria explained, you just have to tick a box. Um, but your application would not be adapted to that, or you would not adapt your application to that position. And can applications be submitted in French or in German? We only accept um, applications in English.
And uh, if I'm out of Switzerland and uh, because I'm doing already an internship or something, but I'm a Swiss citizen, can I still apply? Yes, please do so. There, there is that's no problem. We will then arrange for Skype into you on exceptional basis. Um, well, will will interviews also be conducted only in English? Um, yes. So the the main part main parts of the interview will be in English, and then depending on the description of assignments and the requirements of the specific positions, we will then also test the languages that are required. Then, sorry, I should also say that um, so in addition to English, you should also be fluent in two Swiss um, official languages. So we will also test um, those. So that's either French, German, or Italian. Um, but now I imagine that I'm not a Swiss citizen at the time of the application. Um, can I still apply while wait waiting for a citizenship? Um, no, that's just like for the master's degree and the driving license, you would need to have proof of your citizenship um, before we interview you. So, yeah, ideally at the time of application, you you have to be able to, to share a copy of your nationality. Um, so, uh, can we apply for a petition in English even though the DOA the tour is in French? <coughs> Yes, you can. You can. You can apply in English. Um, so when you finish, when I imagine I'm a UN youth volunteer and I finish my my contract, uh, will FTC or HSC be able to extend or finance an extension of my contract after this first year? Or it's the end. Um, so the the funding is for it's limited to 12 months, and and that's it. What can happen um, is that the the UN in your duty station has funds and would like to extend your contract, and they would offer you either a youth volunteer extension, or um, they can also offer you a consultancy, or depending on the level of your experience, um, a UNV specialist contract. So there are different possibilities. But then that would be an arrangement between you and the organization. And um, the Swiss government would not be part of that. And the master's degree does not have to come from a Swiss university, right? No, not at all. Not at all. It has to be um, from an accredited university. Um, and you find those information on, on the website on the internet, excuse me, um, but uh, most universities are, so you shouldn't worry about that. And do you expect a short and concise CV uh, in the private sector, one, two pages, or can it be longer, like three, three four pages? Um, no, please, I mean, we, we recommend you limit it to one page, one or two, one or two. Um, Try, try not to explain to us what you have done because that's what we can see in, from your CV and that's where you should present it in your CV. Really tell us why you want this position, why, why do you want, why do you see yourself doing those tasks as described in the terms of references, excuse me, in the description of assignments. Um, tell us why you would want to go to a certain duty station, why a certain organization, you know, a reflection of, of of your motivation for the specific assignment. That's what we are, lo we are looking for in a, in a motivation letter. Oh, sorry, but you asked about the CV. <laughs> I'm confused, excuse me. Um, yes, so the CV, about two pages is fine. Um, maybe try per assignment to list about three to five bullets, activities, duties that you carried out. That would be good, so we can easily grasp what you did. Make sure you mention per assignment or per, per experience the exact dates from two. Uh, mention what role you had. Um, and then mention the organization, write out the organization. And um, very important, the duty station. That's often forgotten. Did you work in Paris? Did you work in Kinshasa? Did you work in Zurich? Um, and if I speak German, will my German skills will be tested during the interview? 
I mean, not really, not really. But if you have not, if you have, if you haven't done your studies, let's say you expatriate um, child and um, you have never studied in, in Switzerland or in a German environment, we probably will. We'll have a short conversation in German with you. And uh, may I be sent to a conflict area in my UNV assignment? I mean, usually people, uh, well, usually would say no. But um, it's difficult to draw that line, yeah? Where does the conflict um, end and, and so on? So we have seen there's one, one duty station in Bamako. The country itself is, a conflict, um, is in conflict. There is, a, there is an ongoing conflict. Um, Bamako is rather safe, so it depends on... It's quite relative. <laughs> it's important to know if, if um, security deteriorates, then youth volunteers are the first ones to to be taken out of the country by the UN. So then the UN, UNV would do anything possible to find a new assignment or different assignment, assignments um, in the region or, um, yeah, in, in, in a different country office. Any other questions? Please send them via chat. Um, someone is asking if um, he applies for another position within the UN system right after U the UNV assignment. Um, is that possible? Yes, that's possible. Um, it, I mean, there are very few positions, however, that would require less than two to three years of experience. So, yeah, you would have to go for either a consultancy or UNV specialist assignment. Um, the, the actual staff member positions, the professional positions, the P positions, require usually about at least five years of relevant work experience. And what about health insurance, holidays, or other such entitlements? Um, you can find the specific conditions of service on UNV's website, but um, so you'd get um, coverage by the UN health, in, um, health insurance, which, which is called Cigna. Which is quite quite good compared to the Swiss system. It's a mixture between the mandatory basic health insurance you get in Switzerland and uh, um, what's it called, like the additional coverage that, that you can go for. So it's quite a good one. Um, then holiday, yeah, you I think you're entitled to 2.5 days a month of holidays. And then should you be in an area that is considered hardship? According to the UN rules, then just like any other staff member at the UN, you would be entitled to rest and recuperation. So, for instance, in um, training on, on the duty station, that can vary between um, four weeks, six, eight weeks, or 12 weeks cycle, which means after eight weeks, for instance, you get one week off in addition to your annual leave so that you can rest and recuperate. And the same um, entitlements apply to the youth one year scheme. And Nora, which positions uh, do you think will receive the least applications? Um, so again, it's difficult to predict, um, but based on previous years, we think that this year the position in uh, MONUSCO, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, en tant que jeune volontaire Nations Unies en l'homme, and then the position with UNFP in Nepal as a um, youth volunteer in coordination may receive um, the least application. But again, it's difficult to predict. And um, will we receive support from SAFO once there, such as uh, finding accommodation, guidance for settling down? Um, finding accommodation, etc. these are um, topics that you would have to look into with your organization. Sometimes they are very proactive, depends on who, who receives you, on the, on the individual person. Um, so they would either help you. Um, or you, you have to find out your, your own way. You get a setting in grant in the beginning, so that will, should allow you to stay in a hotel in the first month until you find um, a place to stay. Here at South, what we do, we provide um, more of a career development or coaching support, not 
I mean, not really related to finding accommodation or settling in. So that's very important that you try to reach out to the team before you deploy, try to establish contact, be very proactive. Again, this really needs you to be proactive. They would probably not just come to with you. So try to, to get their the contact details when you are in the in briefing in, in Bonn and then contact them, ask them for help and recommendations and that will certainly help a lot. And um, someone is wondering if a student job during the studies would be considered as a relevant work experience and counted in the maximum of two years work experience. It will probably depend on the relevancy of the, of the assignment. So if you did administrative support, um, photocopies and so on, we won't count that in. But if you worked at, um, I don't know, at the embassy or you, 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 you did guided guide tours at the UN in Geneva, which is highly relevant, we count that in. And um, if I have a partner, would it be possible to travel with a partner? Um, it depends on the family, on the duty station, on the category. So you'll see in the description of assignments that um, duty stations are either considered family duty stations or non-family duty stations. So if they are under the non-family duty station category, you are not allowed to take your partner or any family members with you. Um, and that's, you know, that, that's then true for anybody working for the UN in that given duty station. If it's a family duty station, you, your, your partner can follow you, can join you. However, there is no, no support extended to that person by the UN. So you, you would have to, the person would have to take care of, of the travel, pay for the travel, um, visa, etc. Okay. Insurance, yeah. And um, could I apply for a JPO program just after the UND volunteer assignment, for example? Yes, absolutely. So, you know, again, I, I, I hope I've convinced you to apply for the youth program because I really don't know how else you would gain most relevant experience for JPO positions later on. You gain work experience um, with the UN plus in the field. So that field experience is, is, is you have a great advantage if you can demonstrate that and bring that experience when you apply for JP positions. What you would need for the JP positions is at least three years of relevant work experience. So very often I see that youth volunteers lack some some uh, month or a year or so of experience. So you will have to try to fill that. And um, uh, someone who is asking when they will get the final decision from UND in November or in December? So it's mid mid of December, normally, normally. Oh, beginning, excuse me, beginning of December. Sorry, <laughs> try to whisper to me and I couldn't understand. In the beginning of December, we should receive decisions from UNV and then we, we are going to communicate that to the selected person. Um, however, it's important to know, I didn't mention in my case, I only got to know sometime in January because I was not the first preferred candidate and that first preferred candidate withdrew after um, the Christmas break. So, yeah, I got to know mid-January and then started in briefings two weeks later and deployed again two weeks later. So, um, be ready and prepared for an adventure. <laughs> Okay, I think we come to an end. Um, if there are no other questions. Thank you very much for your participation. It was great uh, to have you all uh, here listening to us. And uh, we really hope that we inspired you <laughs> and that you will uh, send the application for this program. Um,
Nora, Nora has just spoke about her own experience and she, she really thinks it was a great experience. So good luck to everybody and uh, for any other question you would have or if we didn't answer something, just send an email to recruitment at sample.ch. Thank you very much and goodbye. Bye-bye everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.